Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on optimized lighting. In this presentation, we're going to discuss optimizing your lighting by giving you some, giving you some knowledge around light fixture types and why there's such a large array of lighting offerings on the market. My goal here is to demonstrate that there's no such thing as a one size fits all light fixture or layout, and that by taking a few factors into consideration, we can choose the best light for the light app, right application. My name is Brandon Robinson. I'm a member of the Hawthorne Technical Services team with a specialization in lighting and control systems. We're a team dedicated to supporting growers in the controlled environment agriculture space. I'll touch a little bit more on that at the end. I've been in the lighting industry for about five years now, and I've worked it from many angles. I've worked as a field service technician, a GONIO operator, a mechanical designer, and sales support. I've done this in both the human and horticultural lighting industry. So I have a pretty rounded view of lighting in general. In today's presentations, we're going to cover the following topics. Lighting 101, to give those who aren't as familiar with horticulture lighting a quick snippet of some of the terminologies and common facts. We're going to discuss how growers can go about estimating how many lights they'll need in a grow room or facility. The meaty part is gonna come from the next two topics about optics and light layouts. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between HPS and LED. Uh, and then lastly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our Hawthorne Technical Services team. All right, let's get things started with a little quick lighting 101. This portion should only take about 10 minutes. So what is light? We deal with it every day, but if I asked you what it is, you might not really be able to define it. Well, visible light is radiation within a range of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum between 380 and 750 nanometers. Each one of those wavelengths have a, has a perceived color, and we can mix these wavelengths together to create different colors. The light itself travels in what you can think of as packets of photons, and we can think of them as like little balls of energy that are being thrown out all around us. With all these wavelengths and photons kicking around, we need a way to measure it so that we can define when there's too much or too little. In the human lighting world, we have metrics that have been defined for a little while, uh, and we have an entire industry surrounding the art of light design. For humans, we use metrics like foot candles or lumens or lux. These are probably terms that you've heard or maybe come across before. These metrics are based around the graph that are on the bottom right of the page. This is what's called the human eye response curve. It shows us that wavelengths, uh, that humans are very sensitive to specific wavelengths. Particularly, you can see at 555 nanometers, which is in the kind of green yellow area, uh, is where humans are the most sensitive. Basically, this means that if I were to add green or yellow into my light spectrum, I'll perceive that more so than had I put blue or red into the spectrum. This definition of lumens and lux is why we don't really use these metrics in the horticulture world, because we aren't making a room for humans, we're making a room for plants and the way that they perceive the light. We think of lights as bright or dim, and to an extent, so do plants. But a better way to think about the way plants use or perceive light is, how many photons am I getting? Plants take these, pa these packets of photon energy and use it to drive photosynthesis. It's a fuel to a complicated industrial-like process inside the plant. The lighting spectrum for plants can be kind of defined in two ways. For humans, we've had the visual light spectrum in the 380 to 750 nanometer range. For plants, we like to break it down into what we call the PAR spectrum, which is, stands for the photosynthetic, photosynthetically active radiation. This is light that falls between 400 and 700 nanometers. It's the main wavelengths that drive photosynthesis in a plant. But what about the light that falls outside of that range, like UV and far red? Well, this is where the term PBAR, or plant biological active radiation, comes into play. This is all the light that lies between 280 and 800 nanometers. Anything this range is said to have some sort of biological effect on the plant, such as its morphology. So when we break it down into these two areas, 
PAR is really the driving factor for photosynthesis, 400 to 700 nanometers, then the 280 to 400, and the 700 to 800 kind of plays more so with the morphology of the plant and less so about the actual driving of photosynthesis. So if humans use lumens and foot candles, what do we use in horticultural lighting? This is where the term PPF and PPFD come into action. Now, a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, and although they're similar, they define two different things. PPF, or photosynthetic photon flux, is exactly what the name says it is. It's a unit that defines the flux or movement of photons over time. It's a unit of, its units are micromoles per second. So we're actually defining how many photons are being emitted per second. This measurement is usually a specification on a light fixture, meaning that the light can emit X amount of moles per second or X amount of photons per second. PPFD on the other hand is photosynthetic photon flux density. This is what we actually measure at the canopy surface. Its units are micromoles per meter squared second. So it defines how many photons are actually striking a specific area over amount of time. PPFD can really be seen as the light intensity on a surface. PPE is the photon efficiency or photon, uh, photosynthetic photon efficiency. It is a measurement of the, effic uh, the efficiency of a fixture and how it converts watts into photons. I'm thinking about how many photons am I getting out of this light for every watt that I put in. If you look at the little GIF picture on the right, um, I really find this animation helps define or visualize what a light emitting photons looks like. You can think of the hose nozzle as the light source um, and the actual water droplets or the water coming out of it as the photons. So you can see it's a flow of photons. If I had a bucket and I was catching all of that water or all of those droplets inside that bucket, I could then define my PPFD because I would know how many photons or water I'm gathering over a certain amount of time in that area. The last item on our 101 light uh, 101 list is a quick representation of how light can affect our plants. The three crucial factors in lighting are intensity, how much light, quality, which is the defines the spectrum, and photo period, how long are my lights on or off. Each of these items have a very direct relationship with specific aspects of a plant. Intensity is definitely the biggest driver when it comes to biomass created in a plant. More fuel more reaction, more plant is created. Quality or the spectrum tends to have the biggest weighting on the morphology. My thick stem size, my internodal spacing, how far I stretch, things like that. And photo period is pretty much the biggest contributor when it comes to flipping my plant from, uh, from veg to flower. However, each one of these items also affects the other ones, just less so than the one directly above it. So you can see that all of this stuff is interconnected. Now that we have the basics out of the way, let's get into some application of this knowledge. First, we'll talk about lighting estimations. This is something that I get asked the most from customers and our sales reps. How many lights do I need in my grow room? A lot of times it's just for budgeting reasons. Just so a customer or you know, whoever's buying these lights has a ballpark idea of how much money they need to invest in the lighting for the facility they're about to grow for their facility they're about to build. Other times they just want to know, other times they want to know an exact plan. Where am I placing my lights? How far from the canopy? Well, the latter is what we call a light design, which I'm going to cover a little bit later in these slides. Here, I'm going to give you a method of how to quickly estimate within, you know, 10-ish percent of how many lights are actually going to need um, in, in a room or a facility. It's a pretty simple equation. Anyone can do it. Here are the only three pieces of information you're going to need. What light levels are you trying to achieve? What's your canopy area? And which fixture do you want to use? With those three items, you can find your answer. The first point is really quick. Measure bench, width, length, and there you have it, area of your canopy. If you're not growing in benches, 
So on the floor, whatever way you have it set up, just measure the area where you know there's going to be uh, foliage. Uh, basically all the area that you want to have light. For the light levels, some of you may not know exactly what light level you look, you're looking for. You might just be used to the setup that you have and you know that that's enough and you can grow great plants under that. Here are some numbers that we usually use uh, for reference. Um, these are commonly used light, uh, light intensity numbers that we work with when we're designing uh, rooms for different facilities. These can really vary depending on growers' techniques and other environmental factors, watering habits, nutrients practices. So, you know, take them with a grain of salt. For clones, we normally aim for about 50 to 200 ppfd. Veg, 400 to 700. And flower, anywhere from 700 and beyond. Um, generally, 1,000 ppfd tends to be the number that we see uh, most commercial facilities trying to target. Um, but just know that when you're trying to reach those kind of higher light levels, you really have to make sure that all your other parameters are dialed in. A higher PPFD means that you're pushing the plant harder. Uh, I generally like to use the race car analogy for this. So if I'm driving my 1998 Toyota Corolla on the service road and my hood latch is undone, um, might not be the ideal situation, but you know what, I'm probably going to make it home. Uh, if I'm driving a Bugatti Veyron and I'm trying to beat a land speed record and my hood latch comes loose, I'm probably looking at a catastrophic failure. Um, so it's a high risk, high reward. You're going to get higher yields and better plants, but you're going to have to take, a, it's a lot more work to make that happen. So now that we've determined our light levels, what light fixture do we want to use? Let's see, you say some great new Gavita light, something like the CT 1930. Um, what we want to know from this light is the total PPF rating for the light. So the total amount of photons that this fixture emits per second. Um, for Gavita, we make this easy. The light fixture's name is actually the PPF rating for the fixture. So for the Gavita 1930E, it's 1,930 micromoles per second. For the Gavita 1700E, it's 1,700 micromoles per second. Um, if you're used to HPS, like 1,000 watt double-ended fixtures, the PPF usually ranges around 1,800 to 1,900 PPF. Uh, for other fixtures, other companies, usually it's just find their spec sheet uh, and they'll have it rated on the spec sheet. All right, so now that I have all the info I need, I have my canopy area, I have my, my total PPF of my fixture, uh, and I have the light level that I want to achieve, what do I do now? Well, let's break down one of those pieces of information, my PPFD goal. As I mentioned before in the 101 section, PPFD is micromoles per meter squared second, which when I break that down can be looked at as a PPF, a, a total output of a fixture over an area. So I know the light level PPFD, uh, sorry, I know the light level PPF of my fixture and I know the area of my canopy. So what we're really looking at is when I take all of those photons and spread them over an area, how many photons on photons in average am I getting over that space? So we're gonna apply that principle to our equation here to solve for a quantity. So let's break, so let's rearrange this a little bit and do an example. So as you can see, I've rewritten the equation a little bit. I now have PPF quantity, something called CR, and the canopy area. But all the items that I need are still there. So my average PPFD is equal to PPF times quantity. So I'm talking about the total output of the fixture, but then multiplied by the amount of fixtures I have to see how many photons I have in the room. And then I'm dividing it over my total canopy area. So I'm looking at if I throw out all these photons from all these fixtures, on average, how, much, uh, how many photons are going to be hitting these, this surface? Now, that factor on the top right, CR, is what I call the capture ratio or light utilization factor. Um, I'll talk about it in the next slide, but basically it encompasses how much of the light that's coming out of the fixture is actually being captured by the plants. So let's rearrange this equation a little bit so that we're solving for the quantity. 
and we get my PPFD goal times my canopy area divided by this capture ratio times the PPF of my fixture itself. I solve for the quantity using all the factors that I have on the left. So a light level of 950, a canopy size of 640 square feet. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, when we're talking about PPFD, it's meters squared. So we have to convert feet squared into meter squared, which is what the 0.0929 is there for. Um, then we divide it by the light fixture, 1930 times this capture ratio. And I solve for 35 fixtures needed. Great. Right. Now, how do I know that I'm right? Or how do I know if I'm even close? Well, and, and with our tech services team, we do uh, photometric layouts of facilities so that we can determine what light levels are gonna be with a certain amount of light and a certain light pattern. So if I compare my photometric simulation to my estimation, my photometric simulation, I got 39. And in my estimation, I got 35. Not too bad. I'm off by about 10%. I'm off by about four fixtures. I think that's a great way for to come up with an estimation with, you know, within about five minutes. But this still begs the question, well, where does the difference come from? Why am I still off? Well, that's where this capture ratio or utilization factor comes into play. There's a lot of different factors in a room that can change how much light is actually being captured by a light. There's the reflection of the walls. So if my walls are very close to my benches or very far away, it can play a big factor. Um, the, the actual height of the fixture relative to the crop. And one of the biggest factors is the optical distribution. Every single fixture has a different way that it throws the light. And this has a huge weighting on how even that light is distributed over the canopy and how much it's actually being utilized by the canopy. So that brings us into our next topic, optical distribution. In the human and commercial lighting world, this topic is discussed at great length. Lighting designers are an amazing group of people that use light to make rooms visually stunning. They use the right light for the right application. For example, they can use a tight beam spotlight to highlight a product on a showroom floor, or they can use an asymmetrical wall wash fixture to make the stone finish on a wall really stand out. For horticultural lighting, we don't go too crazy in this type of specific application. However, optical distribution in of lighting in the horticulture world is something I find is very overlooked. Um, there's also a lot of misinformation that leads customers to, produce, to purchase the wrong light for their application. Hopefully with these slides, you'll see some insight as to why one light isn't best for every application. So in these pictures, we have three of our lighting offerings from Hawthorne, the CT1930, Boscom double-ended 1000 watt HPS and the Gavita 1700E. Each great fixtures, each with their own best application type. The images under them are what's called a, a, candela, a polar con candela chart. They give a visual representation of how the light is thrown from each one of these fixtures. As you can see with the CT1930 on the left, it has a widespread or what's sometimes called a bat wing distribution. The next is the Boscom, the thousand watt double-ended HPS, which compared to our CT1930, the light throw is a lot more direct, shooting the light a lot more straight down. Then the last fixture is the 1700E, a ladder fit or bar style fixture. These fixture this fixture is built up of multiple low powered bars with this kind of like blob distribution from each one. The images at the bottom are kind of a visual representation of what the light would look like if I pushed it up against the wall. This kind of spread of light, uh, we people refer to it as the light scallop. So we can see kind of how the light looks differently as it comes out of each fixture. Now, to think about this differently, let's go back to my favorite garden hose from the previous slide. That hose has a nozzle and it has the ability to change the way the water is thrown. 
Now, let's think of this as an ideal nozzle where I'm not changing the actual flow rate. All I'm doing is changing the way the water is being concentrated. One, I spread the, the, I'm spreading them, the, the photons lightly over an area, or I'm spreading the water lightly over the area. And the other one, I'm pinpointing it for a high pressure. Now, one isn't better than the other. One, the applications are just different. The one on the left is great for watering the garden, and the one on the right is great for, you know, making the neighborhood cat get off my lawn. Um, it's just one of those things. There's each one is a tool that's better suited for a different application. So let's jump into an example to see what this looks like in a grill. I like showing this example because it's one that I hear a lot. It's an intensity optic in a five by five pattern. I'm not really sure where the five by five pattern started uh, in the industry, but it's a rule of thumb that I've heard hundreds of times. So here's an example where I'm taking an intensity optic, putting in the five by five pattern and applying it to this grow space. So the room is about 24 by 40 feet wide, uh, 40 feet long, and I have, rough, I have 40 fixtures uh, in the room. So this slide is a light map of a vertical plane. Think of it as a heat map, but instead of heat, we're looking at light intensity. That kind of dark orange represents around 1,000 to 1,100 ppfd. Uh, if you look at the color scale at the center, you can get a better idea of what the light levels are in those different colors. So what are we really seeing here? Well, at the top right, where I'm cutting the, the vertical plane is cutting actually on the fixtures themselves along the long portion of the room or sorry, along looking straight down the benches, you can see that I have a large separation of light from one fixture to the next. I get a very direct stream of light directly under the fixture, and I really don't, to see, don't see any mixing of the light until about four feet uh, or even five feet under the fixture. If I then look at the bottom, uh, bottom right or bottom of the slide, I'm now looking at the long side of the room. And here you can see pretty much the same thing. I'm getting, the fixtures are getting a little closer to mixing the light at a higher area, but I still have a large separation of light. And then when I get even lower down, you can see that going from one in between the lights to in front of the, right under the lights, I'm switching from about 700 or 800 PPFD to 1,000, there's about 1,100, then a, a cold spot of 500, and it jumps in between. So you can see that although there's areas where I'm getting that 1,000 PPFD level I want, there's other areas where I'm getting maybe only 500 PPFD, and it creates somewhat of a, a spotty distribution across the room. So now let's change. Let's use the same room, but we're going to swap out the intensity optic in this five by five pattern, and we're gonna change it to the widespread optic. And we're gonna put it in a pattern that complements that type of distribution of light, that wide distribution of light. Now, I normally don't like giving rules of thumbs for any type of light application, but if I have to put a number on it for this type of distribution, four by six usually works out to a pretty good pattern. Um, when you're looking for light levels around 900 to 1,000 ppfd for this quantity of light coming from a fixture. So like I said, same room, changing the light, changing the pattern. Um, some of you might note there's, in this room, I have two more fixtures than I did in the other room. That's just because of the way the geometry worked out. Um, I can I've, I've set these rooms up in many places where I end up with the same amount of fixtures. It, it really just depends on the geometry and making sure that I use the right pattern to complement the room's geometry. So here we can see something that's obviously a lot more uniform and clean. If I look at the top right, the short throw looking down the lengths of the bench, you can see that I'm getting light mixing very quickly. At about three feet under the fixture, I have a nice kind of even plane of light. And it's only a little bit on the outside edges where I'm starting to see a drop off of the light. You can see how this pattern continues evenly down towards the canopy. 
And of course, the farther up, in this case, when I'm very far away from the light, I do have a little bit of separation of light, but you can see that at the even at the most outside edge of the bench, I'm at about 800 ppfd, and in the center, I'm anywhere from 100 to 1100 ppfd. So I keep a fairly even distribution of light from the bottom all the way up to the top. And that pattern stays consistent all the way through. I don't have spotty areas in between or directly under the fixtures. It's consistent. And this is what we're really trying to achieve. We want to get an even distribution of light level throughout the canopy so that the plants grow and operate at the same rate as all of the other companions around it. Now, I'm not saying here that the intensity optic is a bad fixture. I'm just saying that that's not the right optic I would use for that application. And I mean, it'll work in that room. I've seen plenty of grows that use that distribution and they get something that works. But as you can see, we can do better. And so when you're putting, you're installing a new installation or you're building a new facility, we should always aim for, you know, better, I would think. So let's change it up a little bit now. Let's look at a different type of application where maybe the intensity optic is gonna be a better option. So in this example, we're looking at static benching. So I have three rooms set up exactly the same way. They are roughly the same size as the other room, except I only have one bench directly in the middle of the room. In room one, I have the CT1930 with its widespread optic. Room two, I have the intensity optic from the double-ended Boscom. And in room three, I have our 1700E ladder style fixture. So same kind of idea. We're looking at these, these heat or light maps, um, but at in vertical planes so that we can look at how the light is being distributed. Also note that each one of these rooms has 10 fixtures. So same amount of fixtures in each setup. So CT1930 looks good. I have an even distribution of light across everywhere. So with the intensity optic, you can see that compared to how it was in that five by five pattern, it looks a lot nicer here. I have a bit more of an even distribution, although it's a little bit wavy, I still have somewhat of a consistent pattern throughout. Same thing with the bar style fixture. I have a nice even distribution of light. Now, looking at this, it might be hard to determine which one would I really want to go for here. If we look at it a little bit closer, I pull the conclusion that the intensity optic compared to the CT1930 or a widespread optic, which is, you know, if we're talking HPS to HPS, would be something like our Gavita 1000 uh, watt uh, HR96 that has a very similar optic to the CT1930. I would say that the intensity optic performs a little bit better here. The reason being is that, as you can see, I'm achieving a higher light level, lower, farther away from the light, but I'm still getting a fairly even distribution. The reason for this is because with the CT1930 with a widespread optic and a static benching type of setup, I'm throwing some of that light into the aisleways because it's widespread. Whereas in that big room, when I shoot that light in a wide distribution, it's being captured somewhere else in the canopy. But in static benching, I don't really have that. I wanna take the light that I have and really direct it into a specific area. So with an intensity optic, I'm, I'll be able to utilize the light a little bit better. And this optic is set up in a way that I'm also able to get a fairly even distribution of that light across my entire bench. Now, this is great if you're looking for HPS. That intensity, intensity style optic works great. But my number one choice for this setup would be the LED style fixture of the 1700 on the bottom. That is the bar style fixture. The reason I'd wanna go with this application is as you can see, because of this, we're taking a whole bunch of small bars and distributing them over the entire area. I'm now able to bring my crop closer to the light and still maintain an even distribution of light at the intensities that I'm looking for. So as you can see, um, I'm still achieving that 1000 PPFD area, but I really have a nice transition from, you know, 
700, 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100 PPFD kind of moving up. So this kind of works out well if you're putting this in a flowering room where you might not really have to play with the dimming that much because as the plant grows, we're really growing into the light levels that we want. Um, but again, either one of these, any one of these fixtures will work in the space, but there are some that are gonna work better than others. So as you can see, there are so many options when it comes to lighting other than just the brand of the fixture that you choose. But within the brand, choosing the right type of fixture, which is one of the reasons I love working for Hawthorne so much is because we sell LED, we sell HPS, and we sell various optics of each type of one of those fixtures and different light, uh, different you know, total light levels of each one of those fixtures. So it gives us a lot of tools to find the right fixture for your application. Which brings us to the next topic, which is light layouts. This is a service that we provide at Hawthorne. We work with customers to gather data points, look at their room, and work with them to put together an ideal lighting layout. In the next slides, I'm going to show you some examples of why a light map is really worth taking the extra time when it comes to setting up your grill. So this slide is an actual customer case that we had where the grower is very used to growing under that five by five pattern that, we, that he was used to, uh, and he never really questioned it because it had been working. Um, but as he moved into a more commercial setup and he wanted to push his light levels higher um, and also shift to LED, he wanted to see what options were available. So I put this comparison together for him. On the left, you have the five by five pattern that was suggested to him by a supplier. Um, and I you know, swapped in our intensity optic there so that we could show him the digital results of what that setup would look like. As you can see, there's pretty large variability. variability. I have a maximum light level of 940 and a minimum of 600. There are other, and this is at the mature plant canopy. So this is normally the area where we have the most even distribution of light. The other critical aspect here is the height. They suggested to hang the light six feet away from the canopy. And for some growers, that's really not an option. Ceiling heights can be constricting in a lot, in a lot of facilities. So we want to really reduce the amount that we have to stretch our ceilings out. Um, and knowing what we've learned from the previous sides, we can probably make an idea a, a, you know, an idea of why the suggestion was made. Because this is an intensity optic, I have to pull that fixture very far away from my canopy space before I start to get the mixing of light. If I bring it closer, I'm going to get very large hot spots under each light. So now let's look at the same room, but we're going to change it to the uh, CT1930 and or with the widespread optic. Now, as you can see by the heat, the, you know, the distribution map at the bottom right, it's a solid color across the canopy because I have put together a very uniform light spread from end to end. Um, the other thing to note is that I'm only three feet away from the canopy here. So I'm able to reduce that total height of my room. Um, so it makes the application of this fixture a lot more viable. Um, the other benefit with uh, the wide is that if the grower wants to, you know, maybe increase their light levels, because as you can see, the average intensity here between the two rooms is the same. The CT 1930 and this Boscom fixture have almost the same output of light itself. The difference is how I'm distributing it. So I'm getting a more, I'm getting an even distribution of the same amount of light the big difference is that my min max is now a lot tighter. So I'm making sure that the fix, the, you know, all of the plants are getting the same amount of light instead of the plants either in the center compared to my outsider are, are very different. So if the, so now in this application, if the, if the grower wanted to say, you know, move to that 900 or a thousand PPFD average, the pattern of my light for the widespread optic would actually be very similar. I would just kind of be adding maybe more fixtures per row. Um, you know, maybe, you know, once you get to a certain intensity, then we have to space the rows a little bit closer and we play with these, these kind of different patterns. 
Whereas with the five by five pattern, you've already kind of set the density of lighting fixtures that you can fit into an area and you have a maximum amount. Now you can maybe change this to a four by four pattern, but again, you're kind of locking in what light level you can really achieve. Uh, and you're still going to end up with that kind of spotty distribution of light and needing to pull the light fixtures far away. So most of the talks that we've been having with these light levels has always been for this higher intensity of light because we're we tend to talk about flower rooms a lot more. Um, but here's a case where you know the client we were talking about a veg room, and they were hesitant to put the CT 1930 in there because they thought the output of the fixture was too high. Well. I can use the CT1930 in a bedroom, mother room, or flower room. All that I'm gonna change is the way I distribute that light in the room. Instead of having that high density of fixtures, you know, remember, like think back to the way that we estimated the amount of fixtures that we were putting in the room. I just need less photons, but I need to make sure that I have an optic that can spread those photons out efficiently between the fewer fixtures. So this was another customer case. One room is a flower room. Uh, the other one on the right here was a mother room. And in both of these rooms, I'm using the CT1930. And in both the rooms, I'm getting the light levels that I want and the distribution of light that I want. So for the flower room, I was able to achieve just over a thousand PPFD average with 86% uniformity. And in the mother room, I was able to get 600 PPFD with 81% uniformity. And the benefit of having the widespread optic is that by chain, when I change the density pattern of that fixture to achieve a lower light level, I know that I'm going to be able to span the distance between one fixture to the next to get an even distribution. And again, with an intensity style optic, that really might not be uh, possible to do. I'm going to end up with uh, you know, hot spots in, in certain areas, especially when I move to a very low density setup. The alternative is you could use an intensity optic in this setup, but you would have to put more in the room to get the distribution that you want and then dim them down to the level that you want. The issue with this is that, you know, you're spending a lot of extra money for light that you're not necessarily using. Now, if this room was, you know, being used for veg and flower, well, you have the versatility, it, it could work in that case. So maybe that's an area where, you know, the intensity optic would work. You see, I can use each fixture in each room. I just have to change the way that I apply it to make it work. So really the encompassing point that I'm trying to make here is that get a lighting plan. You know, if this is a home grow and you've got a few fixtures, a lot of what I've talked about, you can use to make really good assumptions or really make good ideas of how to lay out your fixtures. But when we're talking about a large grow room with multiple fixtures or a lot of fixtures over a large space, with different ceiling heights and different bench layouts, you know, getting a light plan from a company like Hawthorne um, was going to allow you to have that peace of mind that you know you're going to get the light levels that you want and you're going to get the distribution that you want. The only thing that I'll say is that, you know, I'm hoping that with this knowledge, you're also understanding that when you're reading the light maps, what you're really reading. You always want to be critical of some of the light maps uh, that are put in front of you because, you know, things can be tweaked to make them look more appealing than they actually are. So take the time, work with the, the you know, work, look at the light plan that you have, work with the sales rep that you're working with or the designer that put this together to you and ask questions um, to really make sure that you're getting everything that you want out of, the, out of your room. The last topic we're gonna touch on here is LED versus HPS. Now, this is no doubtedly a extremely highly debated topic, and I'm really not here to say which one is better, but simply I want to give you guys information that you would want to know to help make you make that decision better. You know, Hawthorne sells LEDs, we sell HPS, we're happy either way. And in some cases, HPS is a better fit, and in some cases, LED. So we'll go through some of these points so that everyone is a little bit more understanding about what's different about these fixtures. So first we have, we can go through some of the points of cost of ownership. Um, of course, you know, we're taking a thousand watt fixture and usually you can get that down to about 780 watts uh, or, you know, or usually it's around 25% reduction of power for the same amount of light, light output. 
So right away, I've reduced my lighting kilowatt hours by 20 to 30%. Um, I'm also reducing the total you know, power demand of my facility. And in some cases, that means that uh, I'm gonna pay less for the infrastructure that I have to put in. Uh, I'm gonna reduce the total HVAC load. Now, this is not to say I'm using 20% less heat, so I'm gonna use 20% less HVAC. It's a much more complicated uh, equation, but overall, you can assume that you're gonna have a, reduce, a, a reduction of your HVAC load. Um, we're gonna reduce the maintenance and labor. Um, you know, HPS fixtures, uh, they, the, the bulb degrades a lot, a lot faster than an LED fixture. So with HPS fixtures, usually every one to two years, I'll do a swap out of the lamp or a swap out of the reflector to make sure I maintain, uh, you know, a consistent high output of that fixture. With an LED fixture, you're usually looking at, you know, eight to 11 years before the fixture loses 10% of its total output. So there's a lot less work and maintenance that has to be done on those fixtures. Um, next is utility rebates with LEDs. Um, you know, utilities are putting out incentives to get people to buy LEDs to reduce the total load of the, uh, of, you know, the power infrastructure that's in that area. So although the cost might look large at the beginning between H HPS and LED, when you put in utility rebates, you reduce maintenance labor, you reduce HVAC, you reduce facility wattage, and your total power usage, plus the debated topic of the benefits of LED to the actual uh, canopy itself, um, you know, that price gap really starts to narrow down significantly. The other benefits that you can look at is your improved employee comfort. You know, look at the two pictures on the screen here. Which room would you rather be working in? I'm personally definitely going with the LED one. Set, standing underneath those lights is a lot more comfortable. Um, you also have the ability to better observe your plants because we're using that generally with LEDs, we're using kind of like a broad white spectrum. You're able to look at the plants and identify things better rather than being in these kind of like orange rooms where you might need to put on, you know, a pair of glasses that filters the light so that you can see better. And the last topic is just kind of, um, it's not really discussed too much, but immediate on and off. With an HPS fixture, when that light turns off, it usually takes about five minutes before you're able to turn it down because the lamp has to cool. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just to protect the equipment itself. With LEDs, there's none of that lag. You can turn it off and turn it on with a light switch without any issues. Now, this table here represents for me the real key changes that we have to consider when we're making the swap. Your total light levels, your uniformity, the infrastructure, your environment, and the spectrum. Now, those top three points will vary depending on which specific fixture you buy. For example, if I go from double-ended HPS to a ladder-style uh, 1700E fixture, it's a big infrastructure change. They're hung differently, so I'm going to have to change my roofing structure. Um, they distribute the light differently, so I'm not going to get the same light levels in the same areas. And there's actually a slight, you know, a slightly different total PPFD output between, you know, a double-ended HPS fixture and some of those ladder style fixtures. So if we do a one-to-one -one swap, a lot is going to change in that room. Whereas if we use something like a 1930E, well, they're hung the exact same way. The light throw is almost exactly the same, the exact same, um, and they have almost the exact same total PPF output. So you can see that I'm switching from HPS to LED, but by switching from, you know, the Gavita HR96 reflector to the CT1930E, I'm keeping the optical parameter, the total light output parameter, and the actual shape of the fixture the same. So it's a very easy kind of one-to-one -one swap of those fixtures um, in, in, in regards, in, in those kind of aspects. Um, the other two factors on the bottom, environmental and spectrum, those are gonna change no matter what LED fixture you buy. When you change from HPS to LED, there's a large change to your environmental, your, your, your environment in that room. Um, 
and also a change of spectrum. HPS has a very designated spectrum that really doesn't change much, whereas LED, you have broad white, blurple, uh, you know, dual spectrum, heavy red. So a lot can change and your plants will react to that differently. So let's talk a little bit more in depth first about the total light level. Some people make the claims that when they switch from double-ended HPS to LED, they either, they're not getting the same light level or actually there's too much light. And from my previous slides, you kind of see why. The light throw and proximity and layout all have an effect on this. So when you're making the change, make sure to measure the light levels that you were growing with before so that when you switch over to LED, you're able to you know, adjust the lights and place them in a manner that's going to get you the same light levels that you wanted before. Another reason why we always encourage getting light plans, because this is something you can just tell the light planner, I want this PPFD level at this height for my crop, and we can plan to make the light distribution work that way. So this really comes down to the biggest thing that I'll say is when we're, you know, if, you, if you're putting a grow together or you're working with plants a lot and lighting, get a PAR meter. Uh, it's, it's a really great investment to make, you know, spot checks of what your light levels are. Next, let's touch on the spectrum a little bit. Now, this is not one that I'm going to spend too much time on, mostly because I'm a mechanical light guy. I'm not a plant biologist. All we really need to know is that HPS has an extremely red and kind of green heavy spectrum. While LED can come in a variety of spectrum from broad white, heavy red, dual spectrum, blurple, um, you know, we uh, and each one of these spectrums has some benefits and and drawbacks. Um, you know, like like the optics, each one kind of has its own application. You know, we have thousands of customers with huge success under every one of the spectrums that we have, and I'm sure other companies have great success with their spectrums. I think a lot of people spend way too much time on the absolute minute details of light spectrum when there's so many other factors in a grow that have a much heavier effect on the plant. You know, a few percent of green change in my spectrum is not really gonna change much uh, of how the plant is affected when my water regimen and my total intensity isn't in the right spot. You know, this isn't to say that we're not trying to better understand the subject. Hawthorne has a large research facility in Kelowna we're constantly, run, we're, at the moment, we're running a lot of light trials so that we can better understand how spectrum will affect different plant types, different growing styles. So it's something that's still being researched uh, a great deal. All I want, the, the main point I'm really trying to make here is don't spend too much time looking at the very minute details. Work at kind of the, the macro level first. Now, this last point is one that really tends to catch people off guard the most. When we do this direct change from LED, from HPS, we're making a huge uh, shift in the heat load in the room. Uh, we're also changing how that heat is being distributed in the room. A 1000 watt HPS fixture generates rough, roughly 1000, 1050 uh, watts of heat. And a 1930, produces, you know, the LED equivalent produces 780 watts of heat. So to achieve the same light level in this room, I've effectively reduced the amount of heat being generated by 25%. This means that my HVAC system isn't going to be working as much to condition the room, which means it's not going to be pulling out as much moisture as it was before, which means that I might have to supplement with additional dehumidification units which I'm now then adding more sensible heat into my room. And also the way the heat comes out of the fixture is very different. An HPS fixture has a lamp that you know, gets up to about 600 degrees Celsius, which is effectively like a little toaster oven right above my plant. That's pushing heat directly down onto the canopy. Whereas with an LED fixture, although it still produces a lot of heat, I think it's kind of a misconception. LEDs produce a lot of heat, they just manage it in a different way. LEDs 
take that heat and they sink it through the heat sinks that are behind them and dispel that heat into the air behind them through uh, you know, convective heat transfer. What we're really doing here is because of the shift in heat distribution, we have to take some things into consideration. If I now don't have as much heat pushing down on my plant, that may mean that my leap temperature is slightly different, which means that I have to you know, change the RH and temperature in my room to compensate. So as you can see, we're kind of spiraling a little bit here in the sense that although we were just talking about lighting, making a change to lighting can have a large effect on how everything else in your grow is affected. This is how I kind of like to tie in our technical services team at Hawthorne. Um, our technical services team, we provide analytical services, horticultural service, and you know, kind of everything controlled environment services. Um, we're a team of about 14 or 15 people with a background in pretty much every category in controlled environment agriculture. We have PhDs in horticultural, in, in PhDs in horticulture, we have mechanical, electrical engineers. Uh, we have HVAC and airflow and irrigation design specialists. And, you know, our team works together to help growers uh, in these rooms. We support our product as, you know, we support our product in a holistic approach. Because like I showed in the example before, just changing your lights is something that is, you know, it's going to take a lot more than just changing your lights. It's going to take a few other factors. And we have the background and we have the experience, um, you know, making those changes with customers to help point out some of the things that you'll have to look for in the future. So I'd like to thank everybody today for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Uh, I hope it was insightful. I hope there is some information that you could take and apply it into your grow uh, in the future. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good one.